Welcome to bus number one. So I'll be your host for the day. I'm Michelle Cortens, the tree fruit specialist at Perennia. And we're gonna be exploring the topic of refining horticulture. So this means looking at protected crops, uh, some herbicide trial work, and also mechanical weed control. So let's get going, get your coffee, um, because we're about to start. So we're on our way to the first stop and we're about to find Sonny Murray, the berry specialist. Sonny Murray here from Perennia Food and Agriculture. Today we're at a site uh, where we had our herbicide uh, trial on strawberries. Uh, this trial was a result of uh, survey uh, work that we did with the growers. Uh, through that survey of polling those growers, we found that most growers only apply two herbicides during the growing season. And most growers recognize that weed control is a major part of the production challenge. Traditional weed control programs uh, rely heavily on Sinbar, Devernal, and maybe a little bit of uh, Princep 9T. But over the last five years, many uh, Group 14 herbicides have entered the market. Uh, our knowledge uh, of these uh, Group 14s uh, has been a little bit limited because there's not a lot of trial work going on in strawberries uh, across Canada. Group 14 herbicides are a diverse group, including uh, five different herbicide families. Uh, there's good data uh, from annual crops providing activity on annual broadleaf weeds, but there's very little uh, information available for uh, winter annuals, biannuals, and perennial weeds that we uh, tend to see in these uh, perennial uh, berry systems. Depending on the product, Group 14 herbicides can work uh, pre-emergent or post-emergent to the weeds, uh, but all applications should be made while the uh, strawberries are dormant. So there's a window of opportunity in the fall or a very small window of opportunity in the spring. Uh, the spring window is very short because oftentimes as the weather warms up, those berries will get started underneath the straw. And by the time we get straw removed and the herbicide applied, the berries are no longer dormant. So we try to uh, steer growers to putting it on during that window in the fall where strawberries are dormant, but before the, before the straw is applied. To determine which weeds would be uh, better controlled by each product, a uh, trial was initiated in the fall of uh, 2019 and repeated in the fall of 2020. Uh, the two herbicide sites that were selected were selected uh, due to the uh, variety of weed species that were present uh, in those fields and the distribution of those uh, uh, weeds uh, across the uh, footprint of the trial. We want a very uh, even uh, population of weeds and we want a variety of weeds. Uh, the trial is a four rep uh, randomized uh, design uh, with seven treatments. Uh, five of the treatments are uh, individual herbicides and there are two treatments uh, where we mixed uh, two different herbicides together. Uh, this mixture was done so that uh, a strong residual herbicide could be mixed with a uh, post-emergent uh, burn down type herbicide in order to control the emerged weeds while leaving a residual to control the weeds uh, that may emerge in the early spring. So uh, just to review the uh, treatments, uh, uh, first we have a check. Uh, each weed is uh, identified in the uh, check uh, plot and then the uh, the treatments are uh, rated against that uh, 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 population in the check. So if we have the uh, same uh, population, same uh, level of control that we see in the check on a certain weed species, uh, we give that a one. If we have total control and we can't find that weed uh, across the uh, uh, treatment, uh, then we give that a 10, meaning that it has total control of that weed. Uh, the next treatment is Fomosafin or Reflex. Um, it's a uh, product uh, that gives a very good uh, burn down on uh, Eastern Nightshade, we found, um, but uh, has very little uh, residual activity. Uh, so we found it to be good on uh, buckwheat, lady's thumb, mustards, uh, pigweeds, ragweeds, but only gives you about a two week of residual control, which is quite short when you're talking about uh, fall applied product, uh, you take that to the spring, that only gets you to the uh, 1st of May, right? Uh, the next product we tested was uh, Sulfentrazone, uh, marketed as a authority. It has a, res uh, it has a registration for uh, uh, 
dormant spring application or fall application uh, it has to be put on pre-emergent to the weed so it doesn't give you any of that uh, burn down control uh, compared to reflex it's very good on uh, cleavers the wood sorrel nightshade uh, common groundsel which we often see uh, in strawberry fields it also has activity on a few uh, annual grasses uh, from this product we found that we were getting about a four to six week uh, residual control uh, in the spring uh, the next product was uh, flumioxazin which has been on the market as chateau and it's been on the market for quite a little while now um, uh, chateau is usually taken up by the roots uh, again it has that uh, spring or fall application on dormant plants um, we found that it did suppress some grasses but it's uh, very strong on uh, eastern and hairy nightshade both the nightshades that we find here in the valley uh, it's very good on uh, common groundsel uh, that we often see again in uh, strawberry fields and uh, chickweed and uh, dandelion again this product gives us a four to six week residual control in the spring uh, the next product uh, we used was uh, oxy uh, fluorophen uh, which is sold as goal it was probably the first of the uh, group 14s that had been uh, marketed on and registered for strawberries in Canada uh, so uh, goal works a little differently it's primarily taken up by the foliage it problem primarily works on emerged weeds uh, so once those weeds are up strawberries are dormant we can put it on uh, so it works very well on field violet which we often see in strawberry fields it comes out of the uh, grain fields on the straw and uh, we tend to see it uh, the next year in the strawberry fields uh, field violet buckwheat it's also very good on uh, wood sorrels which are becoming more and more of a problem especially on our sands uh, so we apply it post emergent to the weeds uh, and those weeds have to be quite young so they have to come up late fall in order for a uh, goal to uh, control them uh, very limited soil residual activity so it's only going to work on those very small weeds that come up late fall so it has a very narrow um, application i think of uh, weeds that have come up late fall haven't gotten too big uh, before uh, winter sets in so it's pretty good on those uh, winter annuals so the weeds themselves want to be in the uh, two to four leaf stage, not very well established. And again, Goal has very limited uh, soil activity. So the next thing we wanted to look at is can we uh, match a uh, post-emergent weed type product with a very heavy uh, residual uh, type product. So the next treatment was uh, Chateau and uh, Goal mixed together. So these are two group 14s so it's a little bit risky right you talk to some people and they're saying ah oh, that's too much group 14 you're going to run into plant injury uh, we didn't see any plant injury in the plot so we'll have to continue this for the next few years uh, just to make sure that that uh, at, uh, recommendation is safe for the growers so again here we're putting on a uh, post-emergent product that'll uh, kill the weeds that are present and then a uh, long residual type product to make sure that they don't come up uh, the following spring. Uh, the next treatment we did was uh, Chateau mixed with uh, Lontrell. So we got a group 14 matched up with a group four. Uh, Lontrell we really like because uh, Lontrell is uh, good on oxide daisy, vetch, sheep sorrel, dandelion, groundsel. Uh, it takes out uh, clovers as well. It's very hard on the legume species. Uh, so again, Lontrell has very little uh, residual activity. It must go on uh, uh, when those uh, weeds have emerged. So we uh, wanted to have a look at that to see if there was any uh, phytotoxicity to when, the, uh, when those uh, products were mixed together. So we were really expecting to see crop injury when we did these two mixtures and we didn't notice any on, uh, on the uh, strawberries when we mixed them together. Very important though to note that we did not take these to harvest. We haven't collected yield data off of these uh, uh, strawberry plants. So maybe there was some uh, phytotoxicity that we didn't see on the plant itself, but maybe it did affect yield. We don't know because we haven't uh, taken it that far to harvest. Um, so 
you know, the next step is how do you put these together into a program? And I'll just uh, throw this up there on the screen now. So what we used to do in the old program was as soon as we would take the uh, straw off in the spring, we'd come in with a sin bar and put that on. The problem with doing that is Sinbar gave us uh, good residual control, but it ran out at about uh, six weeks, right? We couldn't delay that uh, application of Sinbar uh, till later in the spring because we'd have some weeds come up and they wouldn't be controlled by the Sinbar. So now what we can do is uh, put, uh, we can delay that application of Sinbar. So we have the uh, Chateau or other group fifth, uh, 14, that we applied in the fall gives us four to six weeks control in the spring. We can delay that uh, sin bar application, but still before bloom, because we don't want to be in there when the plant is in that reproductive phase, because we're going to stress that plant out. It needs all the energy it has to size up those berries. So we can delay it a little bit, but not too much. We still want to get it on before bloom. And now we have that six weeks residual control that's going to take us through harvest and keep us clean until we can get to the renovation. And uh, once we get to renovation, that's a whole different talk about herbicides and, and what we can use at that timing. But it, <clears throat> if we're able to use a group 14s in the fall, Simbar or Devernal uh, at a delayed period in the spring, that gets us through a very clean harvest and where we wanna be come uh, renovation. Anyway, it's been a very interesting trial. We hope to repeat it again uh, next year uh, and maybe throw in some other uh, treatments as well. Um, just to sum up, I'd like to thank our cooperators, uh, Dirk Bosveld and uh, Jim Lorraine for uh, giving us land to uh, put these trials on so we can learn and uh, see how these uh, herbicides fit together in, in a complete program. If there's any questions, please don't uh, hesitate to get in touch with me, smurray at perennia.ca. Thank you. That was great, Sonny, thank you. So we better get going now. And on our next stop, we're going to see Francisco Diaz, the viticulture specialist. Hi, I am Francisco Diaz, the viticulture specialist at Perinia. And today I want to discuss with you about weed management, but not any kind of weed management. This is mechanical weed management. For today, we are located in Sheffield Mills, in Elsla Farm, property of Steve Els, grower and president of Grape Growers of Nova Scotia. Today, we'll see in this location some basic weed management uh, equipment. Mechanical weed management consists in the control of weeds through mechanics, such as hand labor or equipment pulled by the tractor. When we are managing the weeds in this way doesn't mean that we want to have 100% elimination or to have bare soil. If you combine different techniques such as using a good cover crop and tolerating a number of weeds in our area will be enough to keep the main crop in good condition. Steve, thank you very much for your help and collaboration with this video shooting. Uh, I have Two questions. The first is, why did you decide to have mechanical weed management in your vineyard? Uh, you're very welcome, Francisco. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so we decided on doing the mechanical uh, weed control. Just we made a decision to try to stay away from herbicides, um, just for the health of the vineyard. And we also really liked the idea of tilling the soil, aerating the soil. Uh, mixing the green matter into the soil continually, um, using that organic matter to help feed the plants, and uh, just try to make a healthy environment. My second question is, which other strategy you use uh, to manage the weeds? Uh, so the other things we do to help control the weeds is we do cover cropping uh, between the rows. Um, we have a clover grass mixture that we plant in. Uh, it keeps it healthy and that also makes green material. We keep it mowed down. Uh, it's easy to control the mowing that way, keep the edges clean, uh, and then it also prevents erosion.
Steve, could you explain us uh, the pieces of this equipment, please? Sure. This is a Clemens radius arm uh, grapo. Uh, this is the cutting disc. Open it up for the blade. The blade down here, and this is the sensor arm. It's hydraulically driven, and uh, the sensor arm hits the the trunk or the uh, or the growing rod, and and puts the blade back to go around the trunk. Does a nice job. Really. Uh, loosens up the soil and gets rid of the weeds. At which speed have, uh, do you drive? Uh, we try to go uh, young plants. Uh, we down to about 2.25 kilometers per hour, uh, and then a range up to old mature plants uh, up around three kilometers an hour. But our real comfort zone is about 2.5 kilometers an hour. And Steve, can you explain us which equipment is this? Uh, yeah, this is just a simple PTO driven three point hitch rotary mower. Um, very simple, lightweight machine, and it just uh, follows us along and mows the grass as we go. And are you using this equipment at the same time? Yes, we always grape hoe and mow at the same time to get the two jobs done. So you are driving at the same speed, 2.5 kilometers per hour? Yep. Steve, can you explain us this equipment, please? Uh, yep, yeah, this is a Culti Crest finger wheel. Uh, it's self-powered, uh, it just uh, runs in the soil and rotates around. It does a nice job getting in between the posts and the plants a little better than the grape hoe itself. Uh, we use it for a quick maintenance pass between trips with the grape hoe. Ah, uh, now which speed that you're driving? Uh, this is quite a bit quicker than a grape hoe. We usually travel about five, five to six kilometers an hour with this. So, just to conclude, we have seen what means mechanical weed management and how it consists. And also we have observed different equipment used in this type of management. It's important to highlight that mechanical weed management doesn't mean overwork the soil and leave it bare. It's the opposite. When we want to do this kind of a strategy, we need to use a good cover crop to keep the population other weeds under control and also to protect our soil. Thank you very much to Steve Ells for his time and demonstration of the equipment and thank you for watching. Thanks Francisco. So for our last stop of the day, we're going to go and visit Talia Plaskett, our protected crop specialist. My name is Talia Plaskett and I'm the protected crop specialist at Perennia. Today we're going to be checking out a couple different protected structures and exploring the benefits that they have to offer. We are going to start out by taking a closer look at berry production. While we're seeing more and more strawberry producers making the switch indoors, other berries are a little bit slower in making the transition. Today, I wanted to highlight some of the innovations that exist around the production of raspberries. We'll start out by setting the stage at an outdoor raspberry farm. Raspberries are traditionally produced in soil outdoors, and that can cause some problems for producers. Let's start at the root of our production system. Since raspberry canes can exist for many years before they are replaced, there is a potential for soil-borne pathogens and overwintering pests to accumulate over time. This increase in biotic stress for the plant means that it becomes increasingly difficult for it to maximize growth and overall yield. These pathogens can be difficult, not to mention expensive and time-consuming to control. This is becoming more and more of a problem as we see changes in our typical growing season. Warmer winters, combined with less snow fall makes it easier for things to survive into the following year. While this may not have been an issue in the past, it will become more prevalent as we grow into the future. Not only are we dealing with pests and pathogens, but we're also tasked with managing weeds. These unwanted plants divert water and nutrients away from the crop we're trying to grow and not the crop we're hoping to produce. 
The plants are at the mercy of Mother Nature, and as a result can lead to some less than ideal growing conditions. Late spring frosts and unexpected tropical storms can significantly impact plant performance and yield through the early parts of the growing season. Fast forward to picking, and significant rainfall is the source of a lot of stress for berry producers. The result of massive bursts in water uptake from the canes, combined with standing water on the berries, impacts fruit quality, marketable yield, and shelf life. Not to mention, rain through any part of the season is a major spready of any disease that might take hold of your crops. Depending on what the specific pain points for your raspberry operation are, there are a couple of solutions that could be implemented to reduce the risk associated with production. We'll start by exploring Vitalberry Farms Protected Raspberry System. This multi-bay hoop house configuration is made up of basic components and is relatively straightforward to install. In saying that, this basic structure offers a lot of benefits for the producer and the end customer. These tunnels provide shelter from the rain. This will dramatically reduce the amount of standing water on the leaves as well as the fruit, meaning a lower incidence of disease spread through splashing water. Lower disease means less time and money spent on sprays. One of the major advantages to growing in a protected space is the ability to extend the growing season. The tunnels act as a buffer against the outdoor temperatures and allows the covered space to warm up more so than the outdoor air does. This gives a producer a significant head start in the spring and can extend the growing season well into the fall. These warmer temperatures facilitate earlier growth, earlier bud break, and earlier picks. We can see here that the covered raspberries are ready for picking, much earlier compared to the traditional outdoor setup we saw earlier in the tour. These videos were filmed on the same day, and you can see a considerable difference in the maturity of the berries and the quality of the leaves. The second system I want to show you today is a pilot project for protected long cane raspberry production. There are a few differences here compared to the raspberries we just saw at Vitalberry Farms. Similar to what is being seen in greenhouse strawberries, we're exploring the idea of growing raspberries in containers filled with soilless substrate. These substrates can be made up of a lot of different things, but typically are composed of cocoa coir or peat moss. Soilless substrate has a handful of benefits associated with them, and it comes out on top in terms of starting with a green, clean growing slate each year. There's no accumulation of pests or disease, and you're starting off with a set nutrient profile for your latest crop. These containerized plants are irrigated through drippers. Due to the nature of containerized crops, they require multiple waterings throughout the day to keep the plants healthy. This water has the potential to be collected and reused, increasing the efficiency of the inputs you've added into production. Unlike the canes we saw under the first set of tunnels, long cane raspberries are only kept in production for one season. By removing the requirement for winter hardiness, there are significantly more options when it comes to which variety to grow. This will allow local producers to create diversity in what is available on the market and consistency from year to year in terms of production potential. I want to thank you guys for stopping by today and checking out some alternative uh, production methods for raspberries. Be sure to stick around for the rest of the tour to see some other ways to refine horticulture. Well, thanks for joining us on today's tour for refining horticulture. I uh, hope you had a good time. Uh, we'll drop you back off where you arrived. And we hope you'll join us next week in Bus 2, where we'll be exploring technology in agriculture.